It was a match that was to be made in gaming harmony. Sony was set to make a CD-based gaming console in partnership with Nintendo that was to be the fusion of cartridge and disc. Spurned by Nintendo shortly before announcing what was to be a promising partnership, Sony decided to hell with Nintendo and went it alone. Nintendo's stubbornness and typical refusal to allow others to have any control over its properties directly influenced the making of the console, and as a result, Sony became a major player in the video game industry, as its PlayStation took off to great acclaim. In 1995, it made it over here, and a new generation of gamers was born. What the NES was to gamers in their late 20s and early 30s was now what the PS1 was to the new breed. But that's not to say that the older gamers were left behind. Sony had something for everyone, and it is here, on the first of two episodes, we, that we once again dive into the pit of nostalgia as we recollect 20 years of the PlayStation next on Downloadable Content. I am Brian, and we have a full load here on this episode. We have Ron. Hello, everyone. We have Ronnie. Hey, guys. We have Shanna. Hey, hey. And we will have a Ryan. He's going to show up a little bit later in the program. And he'll throw in his own bits of nostalgia. But yes, we are going to talk about the PlayStation 1. Feel old, everybody. Because, yeah, it came out in 1995. It turns 20 this year. And, um, yeah, that kind of snuck up on everybody kind of quickly. <laughs> My brother is going to be as old as the PlayStation. That's kind of disturbing for me. <laughs> it makes me realize how old I am. <laughs> We're all old now. The PlayStation's almost legal. It can almost drink. <laughs> at least in this country. It can drink in Canada. Well, the younger generation's thinking back on the PlayStation we were thinking of the NES, and that's just weird. Yeah, because, you know, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I have friends who are, who are younger gamers, and I'll talk about NES and Super Nintendo games that were of great, you know, memories to me, and they're like, huh? Like, it reminds me, uh, you may have seen these on YouTube, like, little kids confronted with, like, the original Game Boy for the first time. Oh, I love those videos. Look, here's the current part of the dial-up sound to the internet. <laughs> so, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go down memory lane, but before we dive headlong into this... Just want to remind everyone that downloadable content can be found on iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher. And you can get a hold of us in a variety of ways. You can get on Facebook, facebook.com slash dlcontent, at Twitter at dlcontent, on Tumblr at dlcpodcast.tumblr.com, and of course you can always email us at dlcontent1 at gmail.com. So all the different ways to get downloadable content into your ears. Take that as you will. And it is on that note, we will start diving into the discussion of the PlayStation 1. But first, before we get all weepy and nostalgia over the games that gave us fond memories, whether good or bad, I'll have a little bit of history. Some history about the PS1, some of which I already mentioned in the intro. And yes, it was supposed to be a console that combined cartridge and CD. It was supposed to be... A few. It was supposed to be Super Nintendo compatible. You could play cartridges on it, as well as play discs. Um, and there was a lot of of partnership going on between Nintendo and Sony, and a lot of good things were happening. Um, however, even after a lot of work had already been done on the project, um, some head honcho over at Nintendo, some name I can't pronounce, uh, 
had taken... Type it out and I can try and pronounce it for you. <laughs> had a, uh, he had another look at the original written agreement that was between Nintendo and Sony and was actually got... He actually got very pissed off at the fact that Sony was given complete control over any and all titles that were written for this new console... Which sounds like Nintendo, as they had pretty much the exact same thing over anything made on the NES and the Super Nintendo. Like, oh, Nintendo doesn't like to get along with others. And you wonder why Nintendo has such a horrible reputation with third parties. Well, they were both trying to do the same thing. Sony's not, uh, it, they get an equal part of the blame. They were trying to push Nintendo's policy back on them. The right. responsible thing would be for them both to have given a little bit and, you know, had a percentage of, you know, for it, but for they split the... Yeah, I mean... Basically, give, uh, you know, have certain titles that each each have has control over. Like, you know, Nintendo obviously will have its Mario and its, you know, its Zeldas and all that. And then Sony would have its own, uh, you know, its own properties. That's no, there's a, like Snake and uh, Gran Turismo and stuff like that. Yeah, all of that fun stuff, which you know makes sense to us now in hindsight, you know, twenty years twenty years later. But also keep in mind that this was right. This was at the height of the console wars of the nineteen nineties. I mean, you had Nintendo and and Sega trying to jockey for gamers' hearts, and so. Um, but it is here, you know. Yes, both sides were to blame, but it is here where in our story that along comes a spider. Nintendo. Pissed off at this at this agreement, I was like, "Why you didn't read the? Did you not read the contract several <laughs> years prior? Only finding it. Hey, look, look at this fine print. What? Uh, so what Nintendo did? Now this was a really asshole move on Nintendo's part. They secretly canceled the agreement, unbeknownst to Sony. And at the 1991 Consumer Electronics Show, when both Sony and Nintendo were set to announce the debut of the PlayStation, two words, Nintendo announced on the, on the show floor that they had allied themselves with another electronics maker, Philips, which shocked the hell out of Sony because they're like, mm -hmm. Curse your Oops. sudden but inevitable betrayal! <laughs> so Sony... Now completely floored, tried to create some some sort of alliance with Sega. However, the bigwigs over at Sega are like, well, Sony can't even make hardware, let alone try to make software. <laughs> I don't know why I put a French accent there, but I felt it was it, necessary. It, uh, it, was, a, uh, it was actually uh, the, the PlayStation, the Sony side of it that fell through. Sega was entirely going through with that deal. Really? I, I, read, so, I read information that Sega was kind of on their high horse about it, and... Sony was trying to push the same deal that they were going to have with Nintendo, where they would retain the rights to all games on the system. Aha! Uh -huh, and Sega would not do that. Because Sega was going to go all in, that was going to be their new system, but if Sony was going to take all, you know, all credit for all the games on it, then they would basically lose everything. It wasn't going to be an add-on. It was going to be a, a separate system. Ah. Unlike Nintendo's, where they were using it as a supplement. Right. So, after the, after the after trying to get an alliance with Sega, that fell through. Sony was basically like, fuck both of you. We're going to do it ourselves. And the rest, as they say, is history. They did what no other company could. Every, so, so many other systems came out that tried to muscle in and be that third group between Nintendo and Sega, yeah, and they all failed up until this. Because what else did yeah. we? Have? What else did we have in the nineties? We had what? The Lynx. Yeah, the I mean, Atari kept trying. You know, I mean, God <laughs> Atari bless him, never but, gave up. God bless them, but you know, the Jaguar the, that the was Jaguar popular for and, popular for about all of four seconds. Yeah, and then wait, what was the Philips one? And when did that come out? The what was it, the VDO or whatever it was called or V. There was some kind of Philips system that came out, too, that just crashed and burned. Which I don't know if that happened before or after, but I can't remember the name of it. Atari, Atari was just a little engine that couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> poor, poor Atari. <laughs> um, I thought it was the CDI. CDI! I knew it was some random arrangement. Some, some three-letter acronym of <laughs> letters that everyone is, like, hates. 
And, you know, that, that system crashed and burned horribly, and then Phillips was like, you know, we're done with video games. We're done here. <laughs> so, bo both the stubbornness on Nintendo and Sega, and a bit of Sony, caused the PlayStation as we know it to be made, and... Whoopsie! <laughs> Whoopsie for the both of them. They made a directors. big mistake. They, yep, and... The, the system was released to much critical acclaim. It, it had a small handful of launch titles, but the graphical capabilities of the PlayStation 1 in 1995 were unlike anything anyone had seen before. Now we're starting to render things in, in 3D. I mean, you had Super Nintendo games that, you know, I thought at the time looked beautiful. I mean, look at all the games that Rare made. Donkey, the Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct... At the time, I thought those were some amazing graphics. And then here comes Sony, which, you know, we laugh about it now. Ho, 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 blocky, blocky figures. High cloud. But, uh... <laughs> but, no, I love and... cloud and his massive, massive forearms. What's wrong with that? <laughs> and, I mean, there you go. I mean, the graphics, yeah, they're not, you know, like, human realistic graphics now. But, I mean, they have, they have an appeal. Uh, good designs, it doesn't matter whether it's old school NES or Super Nintendo with the pixel graphics. It doesn't matter whether it's a modern one with the polygonal. Good character designs come through regardless of the system. Absolutely. And it was during this, you know, when the PlayStation was released, I remember seeing commercials for it. Now, the video game commercials, I mean, there are only two that really stick out in my brain from childhood. I remember all of the commercials when the Genesis came out, the big tagline was that Sega does... Nintendo what... does what Nintendo... Sega does what Nintendo does what don't. Nintendo don't. Yeah. I, I remember those vividly, and the, the first time I really heard about the PlayStation, and we'll get into this more, Final Fantasy VII. I remember oh. seeing the commercials for Final Fantasy VII, and I was blown away. They did it like a movie trailer. That's I, what they did. I had never played a Final Fantasy game up to this point, but when I saw the the, the commercial, I was like, "Holy shit!" Mm -hmm. And from what I recall, I think that was one of the first ads that actually did utilize that sort of approach to showing a game because most, because of what they were, because they were kind of limited in their you know graphical capabilities, most of the marketing for games was very. You know, it was very heavy-handed. Like we all, like we said, we all laugh at those old Nintendo commercials uh, and the old Sega commercials, where it's all like, "Oh, look at this wacky, crazy driving game!" And then you just see the cute little like Mario Kart graphics, mm -hmm. or like you know, the the Zelda commercial where like there's Link and a bunch of monsters and they're dancing and there's a guy rapping. It's like, <laughs> you know, those old commercials were just so silly and so stupid, and we love them now, but like. I remember that Final Fantasy VII commercial was the same thing. It was the first time I was like, this is me just seeing the game. There's no gimmicks. There's no like, oh, this is what's hip with the kids these days. Let's draw them in with this. It was just like, no, here's a beautiful game. Here's an experience we are selling to you. Uh, we're going to let that sell it on its own. And sell it did. <laughs> that was really the step when they started showing footage in the games for more than two seconds. Because they didn't think... they They thought showing game footage would turn people off when you're trying to sell a video game. And to me, even back in the 90s, that made no sense. Like, they, they were afraid of showing their product. So instead, they do all the little goofy things. And that's that was just... I think that was a bad decision back then. And I think this is around when they realized they could do something different with it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, also keep in mind, just, just the, the technical capabilities of the system, you could fit a lot more on a CD-ROM than you could a cartridge. And developers had... With the PlayStation, the developers had such creative freedom, for lack of a better phrase, they, they were not constrained by the cartridge anymore. They, you know, this was a step closer to PC. It, it costs a lot of money to make cartridges, too, and with how little it costs to make a CD, they could do multi-disc multi games like Final Fantasy VII and a lot of the RPGs, which they could never do with a cartridge because they cost too much. 
Yeah, that's something you will you'll never see as a multi cartridge video game, but you'll get a. They took no, they they that was something that was in production for uh, N sixty four, and they ended up not doing it because of cost. It, yeah, that's yeah, lot. it's it, way too much money. And you know, with all, all the information you could fit on a CD ROM, it was just like holy shit. We don't have to, you know, the money we save on cartridges, we can now put toward you know, creating a richer experience and. A lot of developers took full advantage of that. Yet you notice games didn't stop costing as much money when they switched away from the expensive cartridge. Mm, yeah, fucking. <laughs> I'm just poking the bear, Brian. I'm just poking. You. <laughs> yeah, it's fifty bucks for a cartridge. Oh, but if you can buy that, well, fifty bucks. For you can buy time. three CDs for fifty dollars. Wait, what? <laughs> Like, wait a minute, but you, but you're probably getting a long. They probably justified it by saying, "Well, you're getting a much longer entertainment value." It's probably how they uh, they they spun that. But you know, I obvi- I did not own a PlayStation One until high school because my stepbrother was the one that had all of the systems, and being the older brother, he loved to power trip. So. By the time he got a PS2, he gave me his PS1, and I was just like, well, well good. Oh, you got a hand-me-down. I got a hand-me-down <laughs> PS1, which was Aww. fine. And, you know, something else that the uh, the PlayStation 1 did, it played music CDs. Ooh, we're getting consoles that are starting to be, you know, multifaceted. Yes, I know it's just a CD player. But that was a big deal back then. Yes, it was, because some some developers would put the soundtrack of the game on those discs. Soon you'll have the all-in-one console that will be a TV and a DVD and a Blu-ray and everything else all in one system. Yeah, but that's way down the road. I know. That, that's way down the road. But the funny thing was that because of the ability of the system to play CDs, I remember one game that took... The only game I ever played that took advantage of that fact was Monster Rancher. Oh, God, yes. I loved that game so much, and it is on my list. We will discuss that at, at, at length when we start get diving into the games. But, I, I you know, that was, that was a game that took full advantage of the entire system's capabilities. I'm like, oh, th- you have to actually put your own music CDs into the console to make monsters. But, um... That was just looking so. That was that's the kind of innovation I love seeing. Where okay, you have the stuff that the console does normally. Well, we're gonna turn that on its head a little bit and think outside the box. And I loved that about it. And as as this system was selling like hotcakes, Nintendo and Sega were like, "Shit, <laughs> damn it! Now we've got another. Now we've got an interloper." And it doesn't help that the N sixty four. While we all know amazing games that came off the N64, I mean, Ocarina of Time, one of the best games of all time on many people's lists. But when you really get down to it, like, the PlayStation had a plethora of amazing titles, and the N64 was very disappointing library-wise in comparison. It definitely had as good titles at the top, but there was just so few of them in comparison. That's true. I mean, the PlayStation 1 be- had such an extensive library. Oh my god. There, was not a, there wasn't a better time to be a gamer other than maybe during the NES's heyday. So much. And on top of that, it wasn't even just a matter of having a wide library of games, but I remember one of the things that really drew me in on the PlayStation when I got it was, like, the genres. Like, it oh, wasn't yeah. just a matter of having a lot of games, but it's like, you know... This spe- it's not like it is today, where it's like, well, this one kind of specializes in platformers, and this one's better for like first-person shooters. Like everything was on PlayStation. Every type of game you can imagine was on PlayStation. Even some, were- even some things that weren't that didn't exist yet. I mean, the PlayStation, you had pretty much the invention of survival horror as we know it today. Yeah, they formed so many new genres just by experimenting. 
And, you know, the PlayStation 1, you know, we, we had controllers that started to... You, you had the DualShock, which it, and it, you had Rumble, which you didn't need a separate peripheral for. Nintendo! Uh, <laughs> you had the analog stick as well. Although that was probably around the same time as, this three, as the uh, N64 came out, right? The N64 came out uh, a year later. Okay, and the analog sticks for the PlayStation 1 controller came out... I know they weren't in the first edition of the PlayStation. Yeah, my understanding was that they were the the second edition. Shock, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look it up. Well, while while you do that, but yeah, I mean, when when the PlayStation, you know, ninety seven. So nineties really that late? Uh, retail availability November twentieth, nineteen ninety seven. Wow. Yep. I just turned twelve. But... I'll say that's probably right around the time most of the games that I'm thinking of came out that probably had almost support for it. Yeah, I mean most of my PlayStation use. Brian, you might be th- you might be thinking of this. Um that release date was for Japan. The North American one was a year later. May 1998. Okay. But, you know, most of my early PlayStation you know, playtime was at friends' houses because, again, I grew up in a household in which my parents thought that video games were, you know, the source of all evil. So, they're not. You know, that's that's what happens when you have parents who think that all video games do is rot your brain, make you antisocial, fat, and lazy. So, you know, the last I... two might be true, but definitely not the first two. <laughs> I I have a question, Brian. Yes. Or I have a point to bring up now. The PlayStation competition was the N64 and the Sega Saturn. Do you think that might have contributed for how it became so dominant at the time? Because both of those are generally considered failures in a financial sense, not necessarily from game sense, because I have one of my favorite systems comes from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the point you made a few minutes ago that... With the N64's library, there were some gems. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll, I mean, I mean, we've got Ocarina of Time, Majora's yeah. Mask, GoldenEye, GoldenEye, mm-hmm. which basically revolutionized the first-person shooter genre. Um, Mario 64, Mario Kart 64, yeah, Mario Kart 64, Mario Party, the game that caused so much bodily injury, but um, Destro- the destroyer of friendships. The, the the N64 had, you know, this was, I, th- I really think, while the N64 might have been the first console that Nintendo put out in which third parties started leaving it in droves, because I remember that the NES and the Super Nintendo had pretty good third-party support. Well, they had exclusive contracts where if you... Didn't, if you did not pr- did not uh, sign exclusivity with Nintendo, they would not give you access to cartridges to make your games. Very true. I mean, Nintendo still had the iron grip, and with the PlayStation, Sony still was Super Nintendo, was it? Yeah. With the with yeah, and with the PlayStation, Sony's like, come on, everybody, let's play, and developers flock to that. Mm-hmm. Also, because of the CD format back then, was definitely the premier media format at the time. And it was designed to be used by anyone and anywhere, compared to the cartridge, which was had been limited to the whatever um, like memory insert that you had to use for that. Whereas with the CD, all you need is just literally a CD player, which also was made by Sony. So why not just stick with Sony? It was yeah. cheaper. It was cheaper to produce, and it was easier to design for. And I mean, between those two, why would you go anywhere else? Cheaper, more more room. You can have multiple CDs for a multi-tiered game if your game requires it, such as it did with most RPGs back then. I, d- I did not know this actually. That when the PlayStation launched, it uh, launched for three hundred. I did not know that because for forever two hundred had been the standard. You do not go above two hundred. Uh-huh. Uh, that's one of Sony's M.O.s, is they always sold for more. Oh, yes, and, you know, with, with the PlayStation, I think at least all of us can agree that we you got your money's worth. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, You, you absolutely. absolutely got your money's worth with the huge library of, of titles, 
all of the different genres that were invented. I think that 300 uh, At least it costs less than the 3DO. Yes, 700 700 yes. And, you know, with with so many titles that the PlayStation had, I mean, you have... You, there are PS1 games that I still haven't finished. Oh, me ditto, me too. It's, it's... I still have a little, like... I have a little CD case where I have, like, just a whole whop of PS1 games that I just... I will never part with. They're, they're just that dear, near and dear. I, I, I have a whole list of them that I'm trying to... As Brian knows, I'm trying to get through some games this year, and there's a couple PS1 games on that list. So, you know, it was it was the system to have. Sony was, was friendly to third parties, so Nintendo and Sega started getting the shaft. And it was... It, it, this, this, I think, kind of... Basically, when Sony entered the scene, that kind of... It gave, it, there was a new front in the console war. Sony, I mean, Sega and Nintendo were starting to lose the iron grip. For, for, for sure. Now you have games that can boast features that the cartridges could never hope to create. And, you know, the, we're, we're still... You know, the, the PlayStation brand has become this giant cash cow for Sony. I mean, we're we're on PlayStation Four now, so. And um, I still get use out of my PS Two. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I have not gotten rid of my PS Two because of the because of the not fully backwards compatibility of the PS Three, depending on which model you have. Ditto. Same here. <laughs> yep. Because you know now now with the the policy that Sony has of. You know, we did make consoles with backwards compatibility, but, um... Yeah, now we want to make you buy all those titles again. Mm -hmm. They they saw they were losing money for it, and that's why they stopped doing it. And it's... That's why I have not... That is the sole reason I still have my PS2. Yep. And we'll continue to have it until it dies. Now, speaking of... The PlayStation 1 also kind of changed the sort of way that uh, these companies made consoles because when, you know, yes, there was five years between the PS1 and the PS2, but they were still making PS1 games and PS1 consoles for almost the entire life cycle of the PS2. They stopped making PS1s in 2006, 2007? I want to say... Um, let me get, let me do a fact check. For, yes. Um, and the PS3 came out in 2006. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, the P, the last PS1 units were sold in winter of 2004 before it was finally discontinued for a total of 102 million units shipped since its launch 10 years prior. Games for the PS1 continued to sell until Sony ceased production of PS1 games on March 31st, 2006. So six months before the PS3 came. Out. Yep. <laughs> so Sony, and it's it's still true to this day because they did the same thing with the PS2, and the, and they're still doing it with the PS3. They are in it for the long haul. They they do not do the policy of Nintendo, which is as soon as a new console comes out, the old one is dead. Which is a count, which is a policy I think I agree with, because. Yeah. You have a fan base that may not be able to upgrade right away, even though they may want to. Just due to financial reasons, because people have bills to pay and things like that. What? <laughs> but they're but they're still going to show support for the fan base and loyalty to them by saying, "Hey, thank you guys for buying our product." Um, we while we had this new system out, we eventually want you to go up to it. We're not going to throw you guys to the curb just yet. Um. I know they did, did it. They basically, they basically, Sony has said pretty much since the PS3, and now for the PS4, they're looking at like a was like a ten year cycle basically for for the, all their consoles from here on out. That sounds right. Yeah. Where like they'll release a console, they may release the next version one maybe in like year five, year six, year seven, but they're not going to stop supporting the previous generation console until. 
it has gotten to the point where the newest one is more affordable and that they lower the price on and it's just support for the previous generation just isn't there anymore. Well, See, it's probably... I... Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, you know, you go. You go first. <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> That's fine. Um, it's probably also a smart business model because they're getting money from both ends when you think about it. I mean, when you make a new console and you make the last one immediately obsolete... There's vast ground that you're losing from, A, not everybody's going to get your new console the moment it comes out. Um, you are going to have that market that's going to wait a little bit. And while you have that waiting market, you feed them other games and you're still making money. You know, it's like, so you've got, you've got both crowds. You've got the new shiny crowd who's like, oh, new console hit the streets. I got to get it. And I got to get it now. And I got to get every title for it. But then you have, you know, like you said, your gamers with bills who are like, I don't need it yet. And they're like, okay, well then let's keep making stuff for you to enjoy until you can get there. And in the meantime, we'll make bank off of all of that. <laughs> yeah. It's I kind of a win-win. There's also some hardware like loyalty too, because the PS1 and the PS2 had relatively similar hardware. And I think that was also partly on Sony's where they also designed with like, the, I mean, obviously backwards compatibility with the PS1 for the PS1 game and stuff like that. But like with the memory card slots and the controllers, like they didn't have to. But it was just cheaper for them to do so, so why not? I guess I'll be the sole dissenting voice in that I don't actually think that's a good financial move back then or one now. Because, especially now, when they have, if they, when they continue to support the old system the way they do, they have to make two different versions of the game, which costs them more money, but they don't make as much back as they're spending on developing it for two different pr platforms, their old one and their new one. The old one inevitably gets backlash from the fans every single time for not having things that they can't support on the old console that they have on the new console, and it just ends up being bad PR, and they end up losing money on it. It might be a better decision f for the people who don't choose to upgrade, but it also makes it so that people don't have to upgrade, which makes the disappointing numbers of people converting to the new system. I think the best choice would be to be backwards compatible and cut off support for the old system so that when you move on, you don't have to buy a new library of games, but they don't have to continue to develop for two different systems at the same time. That's just me, though. I'm fine with backwards compatibility just for like the previous generation. I, I, I understand why they didn't really do it or why they stopped doing it, because when the PS3 came out, it was 600 bucks, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of money. Sense. Yeah, it's a, that's a lot of money even back then. I hate the choice, but or I, even I, now, I, I should say, yeah, yeah six hundred bucks is a lot of money back now. It's a yeah, it's like, it's like back <laughs> now. I was like, it's a lot of money. I mean, they they, they minuted it right up. Like we're losing money making this thing backwards compatible. The moment they stopped making it backwards compatible, it dropped to four hundred dollars, three fifty, somewhere around there. It I dropped don't. a lot of money just because of the PS2 and how the well, their cell processor was so radically different from what the they used for the PS3. I don't believe that had to do with the price drop, though. Like, I think that was just two things that happened around the same time, because that was software they were changing, not hardware. Well, no, it was hardware and software. Because the PS3 processor cannot play PS2 games because of the cell processing that they use for coding the PS2 games. And they for the for the initial launch PS3s, they basically had a PS3 cell processor and a PS2 cell processor in them. That's why they're six hundred dollars. Okay, I guess I was wrong. I assumed that the PS3s that were doing it were running them emulated because when I looked at the no, well, no, things they... on it, they were okay. Oh, Sony. There we go. Um, well, PS3 has said we're not talking about the PS3. Let's, we're not talking, we're talking about Let, PS3. let's shift. Let's shift back. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's rewind this machine back a bit. Let, let's let's go back to this. Um, you know, with all of this, I mean, a lot of the novelty was the fact was the fact that this was you know new. It was something that hadn't been done, although, you know, PC gamers are like, oh, we've been using games on CDs and, and discs for, for a while now. Um, yeah, but did it have that nifty, like, pop-up tray? I mean, 
admit it, that thing looked like something out of Star Trek when you first got it. It was like, what? It slowly opened and said, present your game. I am ready to play. <laughs> I will, um, um, you know, do this just data. And, and then, <laughs> and you know, the startup noise, which sounded like something taking off. <laughs> Well, it sounded like something out of, like, it almost kind of sounded like Microsoft's noise when you think about it, like when you start up Windows. It's not that far off. And, you know, also your indicator that the system found the disk. It was like, oh, good, you found it, good. We can proceed on to the next screen. Good, good, good. So... Also introduced the load times. Yay! Uh, base load screens. <laughs> Yay! Which which some developers got very creative with, as opposed to just a straight no loading. I remember playing Galaga on one of them. You know, funnily enough, and I think we're going to start shifting to to uh, starting to talk about some of the games. You know, speaking of load times. I think the first game I actually played on a PlayStation was a game that probably should have been released for the Super Nintendo because graphically it did not look much different than Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. Um, This is Mortal Kombat Trilogy, which, you know, graphically looked virtually identical to Mortal Kombat 3. And... The thing that annoyed me the most, because I was playing, I was playing single player and moving up the line, and I got to, I got to face Shang Tsung. And for those of you who do not know anything about Mortal Kombat, Shang Tsung is a character that can morph himself into any other character at will. And imagine my frustration when I was fighting Shang Tsung, and suddenly the game would stop. I'd get, then comes up now loading because the game has to load the character that <laughs> Shang Tsung is transforming into. Oh no! I didn't know that happened. So That's I'm, bad. I'm playing the game, and you know, Mortal Kombat is a very fast. You need amazing reflexes for that game. And then you know, you're fighting, fighting, and then stop. Now loading. Wait 10, 15 seconds. Shang Tsung changes into his character, the battle continues, he stays in that character for 10, 15 seconds, game stops, now loading, because he has to morph back to his main form. Oh my god. So I made it a point never to play as Shang Tsung, but my god, that was annoying. (laughs) That was annoying as hell. And you know that was that was my very very first PS One game. I mean, I, I and you and you still played games in the system after that. I, Seriously, I did yes, because there were other games that I eventually played. Now my step, as I said, my stepbrother got one because you know, you know, while you know. My stepdad, his father, th- thought that video games were, you know, positively a scourge on society. His mother was like, yeah, here, have one. So he got a PlayStation, and I'm seeing all the games that he was playing on it, and I was very fascinated because I would just watch him play, and I'm like, yeah, I need to play this, play that. Ooh, that looks interesting. What is that? I'll have to play that because then we, now we started getting into the era of the, the PlayStation magazine where they started including demo discs. And I remember vividly going into like supermarkets as a kid, going over to the magazine section and actually seeing kids rip the plastic packaging from the magazine, steal the demo disc, and put the magazine back. Uh, could you imagine being the poor SOB who then bought the magazine afterward and then there's just like little pieces of plastic left where the disc should be? Ooh, that had to burn you. My mom used to work at a bookstore in the early, in like mid to late 90s up to 2000s and that was pretty much like what happened is that she would have to like police the, the rack sometimes every time the the new PlayStation, PlayStation uh, magazine came out. And it stopped the kids from ripping all the all the CDs out of the out of the books. I'm sure there were some bookshops who gave that like you know like porno magazine status and started to say, okay, if you want to buy this magazine, it's behind the counter. <laughs> I mean, it, it got, I think they did that for a couple of the more 
like when when the like the the demo came off Final Fantasy Seven, Final Fantasy Eight, and Final Fantasy Nine. Yeah. I didn't need that for the for the major ones. I know they did that for Valor Solid. Here, here's the thing. Here, here. How many of you remember something called PlayStation Underground? I do. I still have a disc from it. <laughs> My demo disc actually has a big fat ad for it in the beginning. I think I have. I think I remember it vaguely. It was um, it was a magazine that actually came on a CD-ROM, and. You know, it, it um, eventually it became part of the official U.S. PlayStation magazine. But I, I seem to remember that this was sort of like a mail order subscription where you'd get demo discs, the PlayStation Underground, in the mail, and you'd be like, "Ooh!" ooh, ooh. I don't even remember where I got it from. I I have one of them now, and I, I used to go to the Pick of the Litter a lot. I bet I found one, found it there. But I was like, "What's this?" Oh. <gasps> <laughs> And you know, you'd say, what's up? What's on this disc? And you know, uh, they, and the, the, you know, big fat U on it was you know because the PlayStation Underground symbol, and uh, they they it, it, there were two CD-ROMs per quote episode, and you know, I remember seeing some some really cool games on them because they had not just um, demos, but I think there also there were also trailers on those. Like a and sometimes I'm I'm taking a look because actually Wikipedia's got the uh, the full list of what was on the discs. You know, disc one was usually all of the uh, the stuff that you would typically find in a print magazine: uh, notices, events, behind the scenes, hidden context, and the second disc would be all the demos. Right, because I remember seeing in the you know, like I said, I, I was never into the. PS Underground, but I in the ad like they kind of had like this whole thing with behind the scenes, and you would see like NFL players in mocap suits for the next like you know Madden game or NFL game day or whatever, um, you know, and they would have like interviews with programmers and whatnot. So it was, uh, which I think was, I mean, that was some pretty different sort of access for for gamers back then. I mean, yeah, you know, Nintendo Power was always out, but like this really took you behind the scenes. Uh, there were some of those had interviews with figures in the industry. There were, and you know, there were, and I'm taking a look at the, some of the notable interviews: uh, Hideo Kojima, Nobu Uematsu, yeah, wow, Tony Hawk, <laughs> <laughs> that, and that that was a type of game that had not existed before. Then was the Tony Hawk games. Like skating games are oh, nothing, and then PlayStation they blew up. Oh yeah, I mean, as we as we've already mentioned, PlayStation invented there was a there was a, a lot of new genres invented with the PlayStation. I mean, we when I mean, we always had the platformers and the RPGs and the the shoot 'em ups, but then you get thing you know we start seeing more and more variations and and new stuff and. Just a, a lot of a lot of very very interesting things. So it's funny. I have a kind of similar quasi story to that. Um, the mm -hmm. first time, the first time I played a PlayStation was actually at my cousin's house. Um, I'm trying to, I mean, I, this was a long time ago. All I know is like we'd flown out to Arizona for I think family reunion or something, and my younger cousin had a PlayStation, and. One of the first games I ever played on a PlayStation, and how 90s is this, 90s, early 2000s, was an X Games video game. <laughs> you guys remember the X Games? I do remember the X Games, They, well, as in the actual, you know, the, the like the winter extreme sports. Yeah, I mean, for those who are too young to know, the X Games was kind of the extreme 90s uh, batch of sports, which was all like, it was skateboarding and, you know, like, you know, not only that, but like snowboarding and the tubes and the, you know, the half, the half pipe ramps and all sorts of stuff, extreme biking, all that sort of stuff. And I mean, that still takes place now, but the X Games used to be like it. I don't even know if the X Games are still around. They yes, might they be. are. They are? Okay, because I haven't heard anything about them in years. But anyways, um... So I, I just remember, like, that was the first game I played on PlayStation was, like, X Games the game. And, like, me and him would compete in, like, doing street luge against each other. And, like, 
and it kind of, and it had the um, the Mario Kart thing where you could like punch and kick people while you were riding. So you'd have this little street loser just kicking his feet out and knocking out like bikers, and you'd see your biker just tumble and like hit the ground. And uh, that was that's a nostalgic cookie. For Ro- you. Road rash, not Mario Kart. I don't recall punching and kicking. In well, yeah, I guess Mario shooting Kart shells, was just weapons, and shells. But this was that's true. Road rash, I guess, is more like it. Um, I mean, you can attack your your other racers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I always thought was interesting about the PlayStation or Sony was Sony, uh, Sega and Nintendo both had very clear mascots, and Sony never really was able to get onto that. They tried. They they had uh, Spyro. Tra- Crash. They tried. Try, they tried Crash Bandicoot, and you know, then later, and then, then you know, Metal Gear Solid Solid Snake. They tried with that, and. Mm-hmm. But you're right, Sony never really had a sort of unifying mascot, as it were. Nothing with the, with the, with the gravity of Mario or Sonic. Well, so, so, well, they didn't... I mean, Sega had to go through the Alex Kidd phase before they found Sonic. Yes. So it's, I, it's I not tried like... very hard to put Alex Kidd out of my memory. It's a... Sorry about that. I'm, I didn't mean to bring up your PTSD. Oh. <laughs> and... You know, the the other, you know, along the same lines that Shanna mentioned, there was a game that my friend, one of my friends had on a demo disc that I could not stop playing. It was a demo of one level of Cool Borders 3. I had the demo of Cool Borders 2, and same thing, I couldn't stop playing it. I love Cool Borders 2. And I you know, still have it. I don't even really like those types of games, but yet I still have SSX Tricky for GameCube. That's the only, <laughs> uh... I don't even remember which one. I have one of those games for the PlayStation. I can't remember which one it was, but I cannot stand those. I'm not a sports game person, and I love the, I love that game to death. I think I have Cool Borders three somewhere, still. You know, and you know, for all the fun, you know, unless you've already looked. At, I want you guys to, if you haven't even looked up the Wikipedia article on the PlayStation already. What do you think was the top selling game for the PS one? I got the whole list here, so that's cheating. I love that game. I'm going to have Epstein. That leaves Shanna. Wait, what? <laughs> what do you think was the top-selling game for the PS1? Oh, I don't know. Um, I would... Hmm. I would have to say it had to be like a Metal Gear Solid title, or or maybe, maybe Crash? Gran Turismo. Yeah, yeah. Metal Gear was yeah, 10, that sounds about Crash right. was 9. Gran Turismo this whole list, number 1. This whole list of top 10 games, a couple of them really threw me for the loops. Who even, like, uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone was number 7? Oh, movie licenses. <laughs> I barely even had an idea that, like, I, I maybe heard about it once or twice, but it was never talked about yeah, that's when, you know, we had licensed games in the Super Nintendo and Nintendo era, but PlayStation abused the privilege. <laughs> PlayStation. They still do. <laughs> yes, they do! I don't even know why we have movie licensed games still. Those don't... Okay, well... Maybe kids might enjoy them, but I, I can't imagine them being big sellers. With maybe aside from maybe like the Lord of the Rings games, Lego Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that will work. That'll work. Hey, Ryan made it. Greetings. <laughs> yep. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. You, 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 we just actually started to to start getting to talking about games. We we talked a lot about the history and just you know <laughs> the joys of the system as a whole. Oh yes, those few ones. <laughs> So, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to talk about the game. Harry Potter is on that top ten list? Number seven. Wow. Wait, you, is that was a PS1 or a PS2 for that? PS1. Harry yeah. Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah. Where was I when those came out? Because I apparently, I had never heard of any of the Harry Potter games that went out for the PS1. I knew it was that a lot of them were for the PS2, but never for the PS1. You know, up until... Gran Turismo, which I do own. I still have it. Um, even though, you know, I don't particularly... 
up until that point, the only racing game I had really played was Mario Kart. I hadn't even touched F-Zero. And, you know, and then you play Gran Turismo, and I'm like, holy fuck, we've got real <laughs> realism! You've got real cars with real physics. <laughs> and, and, like, holy shit, I actually have to acquire licenses to be able to, uh... To drive the faster cars? I have to, I have to deal with driving your shitty-ass Toyota Honda, or Toyota Hyundai, or whatever the fuck it is, before I can start uh, driving my uh, Formula uh, One cars? Toyota Hyundai. <laughs> You're crossing the streams. Those are two separate. <laughs> you know what I meant, though. I know what you meant. Japan just... car. <laughs> <laughs> right, what are you driving, Japan? That's just... <laughs> Japan. I'm driving <laughs> Japan. But no, Japan. Uh, but what? No, it's it's Japan. That's I have all you to, need I, to know. I have to drive your crappy Honda Accord first. It's a. <laughs> I have to drive your Honda Accord and your Ford Siestas before I can drive your F1 cars. What the fuck is this shit? And, and, you know, and, you know, and Gran Turismo 1, you know, you, you, and you have to actually do things like breaking around corners. Like it's, drifting. It's, actual drifting, drift, not just, like, th throwing your, like, throwing hard left or hard right and having the car go 90 degrees immediately. I could never... <laughs> I could never play Gran Turismo professionally because I always use the other AI-controlled cars as meat shields when I'm turning. Oh, cars. everyone does that. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just like, okay, you know what? I know this is a very sharp turn coming up. I'm going 300 miles an hour. I'm going to crash and spin out. Oh, there's a car slowing down. I'm gonna bounce off of him. <laughs> Because there's no car damage in these games because they didn't want to show car damage. Not yet. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I Not thought yet. at one point they started to have damage. In, in Gran Turismo 1, you had tire, well, tire damage. You could show, especially on the later races, the harder races, you would actually have to go into the pit stop to change your tires because they would wear out. What gets me is that Gran Turismo is on the top selling list twice. The, for, the original is number one, and the sequel is number three. I didn't like Gran Turismo 2 as much. I liked, you know, th there was some bells and whistles they removed from the first that I didn't really, you know, wasn't a huge fan of. But I still enjoy Gran Turismo. I have Gran Turismo 5 on my PS3, and, you know, I, I love it. I, I don't know why. I know, well, I, know, well, I know why. It's not NASCAR. <laughs> well, I also think that up until that point, um, there really wasn't a game where you really had sort of realistic driving capabilities unless you went to an arcade and you actually sat down at one of those cabinets with the wheel and the brake and all that stuff. I mean, before that, what did you have? But like, um, You mean my Mario that? Kart is not accurate driving? <laughs> <laughs> what? I throw shells so, at people all the time when I'm trying to get to work fast. Oh, yeah, what was the name of that game with that. the red That's Corvette driving. and the blonde girl? That's going to drive me nuts now. Cruising USA? Cruising USA, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, that, <laughs> that was the closest thing That's I had. That's not realistic. <laughs> and there were other racing games that tried to to steal Gran Turismo's formula. Uh, I used to also have R4, which was Ridge Racer Type 4. And, you know, that had some of the more kitschy racing tropes, like the hot, sexy girl that would start the race. Yeah, always. There's also your sci-fi racer. What was it? Um, Wipeout? I don't remember the name of it, but it was like... You're piloting... Was... Hmm? I think it was Wipeout. I think you got the right name. Okay, well, well I, I, I've... Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but like... It's this, like triangle-looking ship is the best way I can describe it, and you're t and basically strapped to a gigantic jetpack on the back, or, uh, or like a uh, rocket booster on, on the back of your like, car, and you just, just shoot, zoom around the track only like Mach 1, like, almost every single time. What? <laughs> I've never heard of this. <laughs> it was like, it was basically Sony's version of um, F-Zero. Oh, wow. I have a question. When did uh, Gran Turismo come out? Um, let us consult the wiki. 97, I want to say. <laughs> the, Gran Tur the Gran Turismo came out. No, I don't want the actual. I want the game, you <laughs> idiot. <laughs> I don't want what? the actual real-life Gran Turismo. I want the video game. 
Are you Googling that? Because you know that Google is not going to tell the difference sometimes. December 23rd, 1997 for Japan, May 8th, 1998 for Europe, and May 12th, 1998 for NA. Hmm. Thank you. Because oh, I, I had a weird theory. I couldn't help but wonder, but it, it did come out first. Because I thought if it came out later that maybe some of those sales, and I'm sure prior or, uh, games that came after that probably did this, I can't help but wonder if maybe Gran Turismo and the Fast and the Furious first movie that came out in 2001 almost had a little bit of a... Because think about it. How many kids, like how many teenagers went and saw Fast and the Furious and went, Oh my God, look at Vin Diesel driving those cars. Oh my God. And then they probably had like, you know, they went, they wandered to GameStop next door, the movie theater, and they see Gran Turismo and, you know, they're like, that would be awesome. Much in the same way that... uh <laughs> Dino Crisis might have been a spin-off oh, of, God. of Jurassic <laughs> Park. And, yeah, you know, I don't know. We're, we're almost... It was just a thought, because I thought maybe... Oh, no, go ahead. No, no, keep going. No, I was just thinking if they came out in the same year, that maybe that might have at least given a little bit of an extra push, but never mind. <laughs> but, I mean, the amount of realism that you could get in, in Gran Turismo 1 was a large part of its appeal. I mean, certainly for me. I mean... I, I don't really care for NASCAR because I don't want to make left turns all day for hours. But <laughs> it was, it was. And said you'd rather use other cars as bouncing tools, like your oh. Sonic. A ab absolutely, because you know the other trick you would have up the sleeve is okay. I need to make this sharp turn really quickly, <laughs> and I'm not slowing down enough. Hit the e brake. And... <laughs> Um, speaking of racing games, there's actually one that they recently made a movie of that I was actually surprised at how good it was. Mario Kart the movie. No, uh, Need for Speed? <laughs> Need for Speed, yeah. I was actually surprised at that one. That was actually a PS1 title too, wasn't it? Need for Speed? Let's find out. Yeah, first came out in 94, I believe. Need for Speed. Yeah, 94, oh, I think Need first for release. Speed was, was the first one that had car damage, yeah, actually. Yeah, it was. It was a Gran Turismo. It, it was ported. It was originally 3DO, but it was ported to the PlayStation. Ah, yes. 3DO. <laughs> this, the system no, everybody's heard of and no one owns. Well, d uh, well, let's see. <laughs> that was actually about... 19, 19, 19, 1995, did you have 700 bucks to throw at a video game? How old were you in 95? Did you have... <laughs> I don't think you even seen $700 in 1995. I didn't start seeing 700 bucks until I started working for Walmart. <laughs> Same with me. I'm like, geez, and that was only because you got paid every two weeks, so the orgasm looked bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it is here where we will cut to break, because we've gone almost an hour. So yeah. in our second half, we are just going to go full speed ahead into nostalgia land. Oh boy, that's going to be fun. So I hope you people have your lists of games ready. So Hell yes. In the meantime, I'll give you some PS1 game music to listen to <laughs> in the intermission. I'll go off and play, I'll go off and play like Parappa the Rapper or something. And yes. kick punch it all in the Kick mind. punch it all in the rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're listening to the PlayStation Anniversary Episode Part 1 here on Downloadable Content. We'll be back.
Welcome back to Downloadable Content, talking about the 20th anniversary of the PlayStation. We are all still here. We have not been sucked back into the land of Crash Bandicoot or Spyro. <laughs> we're not waiting on load screens to get on and <laughs> have this conversation. Uh, we're all here. We're all, we're all still here. Mm-hmm. We had to change the disc, that's all. Change the disc. <laughs> <laughs> There's this something that happened quite a lot. So on the second half, we are going to focus primarily on the nostalgia. We're going to start. To, we're just going to go around and you know having some some in depth discussion on games that we remember fondly for good or for bad. Oh boy. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, you have to take the rough with the smooth. It's just it's just how things are. So I just have a bad feeling that mine are going to be a lot of mainstream titles. We, I'm, I'm willing to bet that between the five of us, we have a lot of games that are probably shared among us. But instead of opening with, with a, a massive one, um, I'm going to open up with... Something that um, kind of sort of has a cult following at this point. Um, some of you may or may not have played the Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver games. That's on my list. That is on your list. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I've played one of them because I know there were multiple ones. But the thing that, that I, I remember most about the game was the voice acting. Oh, the voice acting was amazing. It, awesome. it was, you know, while, uh, believe me, PlayStation 1 games are loaded with horrible examples of voice acting <laughs> because voice acting was new. Well, you were the, almost the, the a legacy. teal sandwich. Oh, God. The, <laughs> the Legacy of Gain ones were definitely uh, overly dramatic at times, but they were leagues ahead of where everything else was. You know, and, well, I mean, obviously you had a Tony J. Mm-hmm. Tony J, who is, t- to me, one of the best and dead voice actors <laughs> ever, because you would recognize his voice anywhere, if not by name. If you didn't know who Tony J was, he had a like, pretty extensive video game resume, but he was also in a lot of movies. Um... You may know him as the voice of Frollo from Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame. Oh. Oh, okay. Ah, yep, that makes sense. Yes, he has a name. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, he was the voice of Dr. Lipschitz on Rugrats. Yes, yeah. that brings back memories. Yeah. Be- you would recognize him because he had such a deep, deep baritone voice, and he played, what, the Elder God in, uh... Yes, he did. In, in Soul Reaver? He did play the Elder God in Soul Reaver. He, he was he was muscling in on Morgan Freeman's turf apparently as as a, <laughs> as people who could play deities. So, mm. I, I actually started off on that with uh, Blood Omen: The Legacy of Cain. Okay. Um, bef- yep. For Soul Reaver. I'm and try- that I'm trying to remember the chronology of that. It was just yeah. Blood Omen: Legacy of Cain was the first one where Cain is the protagonist, and then after that game when he basically dominates the world. Soul Reaver is now, he's the villain, and Raziel is the new hero for Soul Reaver, and then every sequel switch, the sequels all switch between whether you're playing Kane or Raziel, showing you more and more of what led to the present day, or showing where it's going. Basically, it switches between them, giving you more of the story each time, because neither of them have all of it. From what I remember of the story, it was an incredibly, you know, very gothic, dark. very dark, very gothic story, but very graphically very good for the PS One. Um, wasn't wasn't the wasn't the, well, I mean, there's going to be a lot. Spoiler alerts are going to happen, people. <laughs> just, That's for sure. Just gonna throw that right out there before we get. Before we go too far into the second half, there's going to be spoiler alerts. So if you do not want to listen, you you may leave now. <laughs> you may leave now. So with that, if you listen, it's on you. If, mm-hmm. There's no, no complaining out there, internet. <laughs> you've you've been. You can't, you can't stop the internet from complaining. Yeah, you, well, well, you've yeah, been. Yeah, you know that by now. That's like you, star stopping the ocean from being wet. Yes, but <laughs> that's that's an excellent analogy, actually. <laughs> But um, but wasn't the character of Rizel, You know, he, he was he was a, a live character. So he's he's dead. Uh, he was a vampire who was one of uh one of because Cain Cain was the last vampire in the original Legacy of Cain, uh, Blood Omen: The Legacy of Cain. Right. And then he created children. Um, and Raziel. Don't think he was he was either uh, a direct child of Cain or he was like Cain's grandson, like one of Cain's children one of uh, Cain's children made him. Um, but he ended up evolving faster than the others, because vampires in this, um, they gain new abilities um, over time. The older they get, the stronger they get, and he got an ability Cain did not have, because Cain was the oldest of them, so he got everything first. Right. Um as the creator. So, uh, Cain, in jealousy, or at least so we thought at the beginning of the game, uh, kills Raziel. Uh, throws him to his death. And Raziel survives, and the whole point of the game... Um, he, he survives as a spirit being, but he survives. And the whole point of the game is to hunt down and kill Cain for murdering you. And uh, you find out later that if you kill Cain, you can fix the world. In quotation marks, because everything you're told in the first game is kind of a lie. Something that GLaDOS would later pick up on. (laughs) (laughs) You shouldn't trust Elder Gods. I think we all knew that going into the game. You shouldn't trust most gods, period. (laughs) Yes, but if you put Elder in front of their name, that's that's a dead giveaway. You don't trust Cthulhu. We're also looking at you, God of War. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this is a slightly off topic, but I was talking to Deja about I really hope the final God of War game is a young hero that you play as and he's the, Kratos is the final boss. Like, the, the person you built up in all of these games, now you have to end up fighting him. That's the only way this would have a good ending. And, you know, I, I remember... You know, I I did play so I played the first Soul Reaver after I saw my stepbrother play it, and I was very intrigued by the story. But very intrigued by the story. But I, as I've already mentioned, the voice acting was amazing. I mean, I mentioned Tony J. Michael Bell played the voice of Raziel, and I'm t- and I'm taking a look at 
uh, Michael Bell's resume. And here's, and I'm like, because that name sounded familiar, and now I know why. Because uh, he was another Rugrats uh, alumni. He played the, he had the voices of Chaz Finster, Drew Pickles, and Grandpa. Oh, wow. <laughs> I loved Grandpa on the Rugrats. Um... Uh, and, um, uh, let's see. What else did he do? He was in Eternal Darkness. He was in Metal Gear Solid 3 as the Fear. Oh, he was in Xenosaga Episode 2. Interesting. Didn't know that. Sure. So, you know, very extensive resume these guys have. And, you know, the, the actors that, uh, there were actors that reprised their roles from Blood Omen. I just looked up Simon Templeman, that is Kane, yep. both from Blood Omen and Legacy, and uh, Soul Reaver. He was Logan from Dragon Age. Really? <laughs> well, if you just turn if you just turn him into a vampire, he's playing the exact same character. How about that? <laughs> how how about that? But I don't know how I didn't recognize the voice. Now that I'm thinking back on it, I'm like. That's he's pretty much just doing game. It's like, wait a minute! I know <laughs> that. So that that is uh, Soul Reaver, and since I took one off of Ronnie's list, I'll give one. Ronnie can go next. Yes. <laughs> oh, can I? Okay. One, ga- gonna go- one game. I know. I know. I'm gonna go for a more offbeat title. I'm gonna go with Saga Frontier. Anybody around here heard of it, or am I the only one? I have Wait, heard of one? it. Saga Frontier? Yes, yeah, Saga That's Frontier. That's a new one for I've me. I've heard of that one before. I yeah. came out 1996? Sounds I right. say. I know, it was, I know it was early on. Early it was on. early on. I played it. I think I own it, actually. Yeah. Saga Frontier actually did very well. It did better outside of America than it did inside of America. Uh, it was one of the early RPGs on the PlayStation. Uh, and it was it, ha- it had a lot of very unique things about it that was very different. Um, you were basically, uh, except you played as six different characters you could choose from at the beginning of the game. Every one of them had their own game completely separate. So you basically own, own unique story, own unique yeah. um, mechanic too. Different bosses, different areas. Um, you have one shared world. It just certain sections you can only go into with certain characters, but. 90% of the game is open to everyone and you can go wherever you want. You can do 10, 10, 15 minutes into the game, you can go anywhere pretty much with almost all the characters. Um, there are very... some... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, no, go no, go ahead. I was going to say, there is some overlap with party members. I do, I do remember yeah. that. There are some overlapping was... party members that you recruit mainly because some of them if because of how the, the game's combat system worked, you had a random chance of learning like almost any move in the game. Well, and the more you use an ability, the more you're going to learn the next one of it. And if you yeah. learn certain abilities, it unlocks new abilities. Like if you have this, this, and this already learned, now you can learn this. But it is kind of random yeah. how it happens. It is random, and I, I do remember that one of the particular party members you could recruit was important because she could learn what is arguably the strongest move in the game relatively early on. Okay, there's a couple different characters that could be, but I, I yes, there there are certain ones you get, absolutely want to get. Um it the game had like 30 characters that you, you could sounds get about your- right? Yeah. So you couldn't uh, only one character. So like I said, you have uh 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 I'm sorry. You have eight playable characters. Um one of them and it's the my favorite one was uh, loot. Loot's story is you, his father is killed, and you know where the last boss is, and that's it. Every side quest that every other character gets is unlocked with him. His entire game is ten minutes into the game, you can go and fight his last boss, but you'll get your ass handed to you. The whole point of his quest is go do every side quest everyone else has ever gotten completely customize your character however you want recruit every playable character from every other game every one of them is accessible to him and go rock everyone's socks and I thought that was the greatest thing ever I don't remember the loot side story um, the one that stands out to me is the I forget that his red I believe his name is 
Yep. Where he sur where he's Super in a car hero. crash. Yes, yeah. Be he literally becomes um, uh, the Red Ranger. Yes, and he can't transform if you have humans in your party because they'll know who he is. Yeah. So he, and so you had this weird dichotomy of like, and you all, you you get completely moves to completely different moves too from when he's um, what is it like Red Ranger like, like Red Ranger Z? Yes. Yes. And, and and when, he, to, when he's Red Ranger Z, and when he's when he's red, and you have to hope that like like with him when you're in a boss battle, because you have humans on your team, sometimes you can't take off, so you have to wait for the enemies to kill the other people so you can transform. So like you're just and like, I'm just... not gonna kill that guy, just let him die. Uh, um, the one story I really liked was uh, uh and I'll, I'll I'll end on this one because we have other things to go on to, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, blue. Blue had a very interesting story, because in this game, um, everyone can learn magic, but you have to uh, learn the affinity for it in different areas. Um, and any character in any of the stories uh, can do that except for the robots. Any living thing can. Um, but every magic has an opposite side. So if you learn one, you can't learn the other. Um, well, like, blue... Yeah. I was like, one of the more common ones is like, you can learn time, but you cannot learn space. Exactly, exactly. Light and shadow... Um, so Blue, the whole point of Blue's story is um, him and his twin brother both came from this, from different schools of magic on the same world, and they're trying to compete to become the greatest mage on their thing because there's this ancient evil that's awakening in their home. And they each are going off trying to get, trying to learn each of the schools of magic, and then at the end, they face each other. Whoever, the one thing I thought that was cool is at the very end, um, Whichever character wins, it doesn't matter. If you lose the battle, um, they it's not game over. Yeah, it's not game over because you find out in their story that they're two sides of the same person. They were split so that they could learn all of the magic because no one else could. So whoever wins, that's the sprite you play with for the end of the game. Um, and that's the only difference. And you still get to play through the end of the game with all of the magic in the game. That was awesome. Yes, I'll let I'll let somebody else go now. Saga Frontier was a very uh, a, a very underrated early RPG that uh, definitely influenced a lot of things with its non sequential storytelling and uh, an interesting combat system that kind of broke the norm. Shanna, you're it's up. my interest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up. Okay, you're um, up. Am I really going to be the first one to really go into Crash Bandicoot? Yes, you are. Uh, I guess it. I am. Well, I mean, I know, I know. There's a lot of heavy hitters up there, and so I did. I didn't want to just splooge them all at once. So you know, <laughs> oh, no, I know, I know. Gradually um, work them in. So go ahead. Well, I mean, I'm. What can I say? I mean, you know, like we said, Nintendo had Mario, Sega had Sonic, and Sony didn't have a standout mascot. But I'd say this. I, I would say Crash was kind of close. And, um, you know, he was just an idiot marsupial for the most part. The whole game was basically just one big, long, interactive cartoon when you really look at it. But that, it's so funny. Like, I, you know, before we got on this podcast, I, you know, I popped a couple of the old Crash games in. And those games are so fun, even today. Um, there is so much humor in them. And there's so much, like, comedy in them. And you can kind of see almost, like, like where uh what was it naughty dog would go with like jack and daxter um but there's like i mean just little things like i was playing crash bandicoot 3 which is kind of like the time travely third installment of the game it's crash bandicoot warped um and like the first level you go through is kind of like a medieval looking level but if you die at the hands of a baddie it's not just like oh you just flop over and you that's it like they would have things like if you were killed by a frog, the frog would pounce on you and kiss you, and then it would turn into a prince. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Or, yeah, like, there was just silly things like that. Um, and even just, like, again, some of the baddies in them themselves were silly. Like, another thing that was in that level is, like, one of the things you have to avoid is a knight who just can't pick up a sword, and he just keeps swinging it around in a circle. I mean, it's not anything coming to attack you. It's just something stupid that makes you chuckle. Um... But that was what I think I really liked about those games was because they were just really silly and stupid and fun and mm. like you could just sort of like relax and have a good time with those games. 
my favorite of the series is the third game, actually. Warped, right? Uh, warped. The, the time travel yes, one. Yes, yeah. that was because, again, you know, it was also the first of the Crash Bandicoot games I played was the third one. And it was just unlike any platformer I had ever played because, first of all, the perspective. You weren't going your, your typical left to right on a screen. You were going front to back. <laughs> and the thing was, though, that they would have a left or right every once in a while. They would switch up the perspectives on you. They would, like typically for like the the bonus stages or for the like the the little hidden parts of the board where you can collect extra fruit. Uh, yeah, they were like apples <laughs> or something. Crab apple, apple fruit yeah. things, and you know, you know, you and you had you know instead of you know jump, you had jumping. You could spin. Um, mm-hmm. You had a slam move where you could jump, and then I think you'd hit circle, I want to say, and then you'd belly flop. And then you had that little mask as a companion that would uh, also uh, take damage for you. Oh my god. Thank you. That Ooh, was... god. Ooh, god. I don't know if that's exactly <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. And if you got if you got multiple ones during the level, you'd, you'd have uh, what was essentially temporary invincibility, invincibility, like you got the star for Mario. Yeah, it was essentially the same thing. You would run and like things would just explode in front of you. Like boxes would just open, enemies would die. Although there were some annoying things about that game, like the TNT boxes. If you accidentally trip one of those, like oh, and suddenly he's he blew up, and uh, now he's just a pile of eyes on the ground. Nice. Uh. <laughs> Well, it wasn't like there was the TNT boxes were, which weren't so bad because they would actually they were timed. They were timed, so you can get away. The nitro nitro, boxes, those were the ones I was thinking of. Were the ones that got the green boxes because that was instant death if you hit those. Although, <laughs> it, although if you spun into a TNT box, it would explode. Oh yeah, yeah. No, you, you didn't you didn't get the benefit of a three second timer. You, you if you accidentally spun in a boom, you're dead. Yep. And wasn't it, yeah, I think, in Crash, in the third game, where you played as other characters? Because there were some levels where another character would just, like, shove Crash out of the way. Like, yeah, you would play as his younger sister. Yeah, that's something like... Uh, yeah, and I remember she that. Would usually, yeah, she would make friends with cute little animals, and um, she would ride the animal through the stage. So, like, there's a, a, like, it looks like a feudal China sort of stage. Where like you walk up into the in the game and this little tiger is there and you have to it's basically like a you know you're riding the tiger and it's like faster than the other levels. It was adorable. It was so cute. <laughs> it was so cute. I'm like oh. Especially because like at the end of the stage it would like nuzzle you and purr before you went away and I was like oh that's so cute. And I that, loved it. That that sort of thing reminded me of being able to uh, use the animals in Donkey Kong Country, like uh, Winky or. Uh, on guard. Yeah, it was the same thing, yeah, yeah, basically. Or the rhino, I forget his name. But, uh... <laughs> so, then I went back, I actually downloaded the first game, the first Crash Bandicoot on, on the PlayStation Network, and, you know, when you play that on an HDTV... <laughs> <laughs> the things, yeah, some of these PS1 games... Do not hold. Do did not age well. Uh, yeah. be at its finest, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, maybe maybe 480p. Might be 360. Oh, Ooh, that's even worse. So I definitely played. A, um, I definitely played. I, it wasn't the actual Tomb Raider. It was the one that was on my old demo disc. But like, I couldn't even see it. It was literally just like. I saw an outline of her and nothing but, like, just the tri- garbage. Uh, triangular breasts and, uh... uh yeah, it's and, and, nice. and, and you moved on. So there we are. There's Crash. That was and, a fun romp. And uh, Crash Team Racing was also pretty fun. I mean, it was a <laughs> clear was, knockoff. Was the most fun things I ever got to do, especially with the mask. And then, if you remember, the hook. Yup. I mean, it was a clear <laughs> Mario Kart knockoff, but it was yeah. good. Yeah, so was Sonic Team Racing and Diddy Kong Racing and... Oh, yes. And Crash actually had enough characters to fill it out, because some of the other games, like, were like, oh, they're stretching here, but it's like, they would take, like, they took the little the little cute tiger and the little cute polar bear and gave them carts. Um, some of the, like, some of the, your favorite bosses had carts, like uh, Tiny Tiger and Dingo Dial, and, mm. like, so they, they're actually able to pull it off really well. So... Yes, those were quite fun. Now we're going to shift to Ryan. 
All right, this one is actually, I'm going back into the RPG genre. This was actually the first one I, I got into, if you all remember, Legend of Dragoon. Amazing oh, yes. game. Yeah. Love that game. Amazing what? game. One of the most underrated games I have ever played. I mean, I love the elements of that so much. The things that were tricky, though, were trying to get the addition combat system now, especially when you got into the higher and more combat ones. I can remember going through those ones and trying to freaking level them up when you get when you tried to get the um, the timing right. And then you had the problem of the PlayStation controller sometimes wearing out on you and the X button getting stuck. So you couldn't always hit it right. <laughs> I never had that problem. What the problem I would have is, especially with the later ones, the later editions, which, bef which I thought were, and that was an excellent addition to your typical turn-based mm. battle. I thought that was a great addition. <laughs> no pun intended. Um, <laughs> but like, when you were trying to do an addition, sometimes the enemy would counterattack. Suddenly you'd have the like the blue square going very quickly down yeah. to the, and then suddenly it would shift change orange and you'd have to very quickly be like oh shit hit square <laughs> and then and yeah. then and then you'd have to go right back to X to continue the addition so it was like ooh this is almost a precursor to the abuse of quick time events <laughs> but uh yeah, one of the best things I can actually remember about this, and I had to say this, the graphics on Legend of Dragoon rival that of um, some of the Final Fantasy games that were on PlayStation 1, especially when they were going into the uh, Dragoon mo mode. I gotta say, the I keep on forgetting what the ultimate dra dragon was. Oh, the, the, divi the Divine the Dragon. The Divine Dragon, yes. Yeah, that transformation just made my jaw drop. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, it, and the and the storyline too to, was amazing as well. You n you did not expect unless you like um uh, somehow read ahead. You did not expect what would happen to Shauna to actually go. I think that's what her name was in there. The the damsel in distress. Yeah, yeah, Shanna. Shanna. Yeah, Shauna. Shanna. You did not expect that to happen at the end, but it's just like the ending of that was freaking um amazing to that. And when you find out about what happened. And like how it plays on a war that happened so long ago, it's just like holy crap. It was an excellent story, and the fact that you know each and en most enemies had an elemental component to them, and you could yeah. you could see it in the title of their name, what color it was, to denote what uh, what elements they were. And you know you had all your different characters. You had uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head. Dart. Shauna, Rose, yep. Albert, Lavitz. Albert Lavitz, such a good Jewish name. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Rose, I can remember, was always one of the mo most deep and interesting characters that you ever got to use because of her story w with it. Uh, then you had Hashel. Hashel, uh, oh, I'm trying to remember which one that was. Yeesh. He was he was the uh, the fighter, the dojo guy. Hashel. Oh, yeah. And then you had some... Kongle. Let me see. Kongle. Yeah, the big guy. Kind of... And then who the heck was that evil bastard that that we all hated so much? Oh yeah, Lloyd was a pain in the ass. Lloyd, I remember that. that and, and one other playable character, Maru. Oh, M Maru! Oh yes, the uh, fun one, the uh, cleavage one, as I call it. M Mar Maru always made me think of Selfie from Final Fantasy VIII <laughs> because she she has that same amount of annoying sprightly energy. I like trains. Trains take me away. <laughs> she had the same amount of of annoying happiness, and but, I remember but, that. But yeah. her, but she had a very interesting story as well, because the sprightly happiness was a facade for brooding, and uh, oh yeah. But you know, some of the the antagonists in that game, like Emperor Dole, uh, Bruegel. And then the biggest SOB that you had to go against, Melbu Frama. Melbu Frama, yes, a four-part final boss battle because we don't have enough <laughs> of those in RPGs. <laughs> so, Andros, you revealed your true form, and uh, <laughs> that was an interesting battle. Um, unless you got there was there was one item in the game that was sold by one store 
early in the game that would that was essentially the ribbon. Yes, I remember the ribbon and why you needed it so much because Melville Farmer, I forget if it was his I think it was his first form that he could cast instant death and if you didn't have the ribbon, bye bye. That was like the biggest obstacle that anybody ever had unless you actually read a guide that said get the ribbon early on, you will need it later. Well here's the thing, this is one of those rare RPGs that I've beaten multiple times. Usually when I play a game that's like 30, 40 hours, once I beat it, that's it. Mm. Because there's, for me, a lot of RPGs don't have much replay value, at least for me. So, you know, I beat it originally on PS1 without the ribbon. That was a challenge. <laughs> it can be done. Yes, it can. It but can it be done. Can, yes. You just better make sure you have a lot of healing uh, and, and resurrecting items. But it can be done. Then, once... Uh, and then I, I downloaded Dragoon on PS3 off the PlayStation Network. Mm. And then, you know, I remember that there was the ribbon, and I went back to get it before the <laughs> final... But And then Melbu Frama became a joke. Right. It's amazing how that one item shifts the difficulty <laughs> of the final battle so far in your favor. It's like, oh, now every status effect is nullified. All right, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck you and the horse you ride in on. <laughs> <laughs> I forget, what the, was, the, was this one actually one of the ones that had a uh, side boss that was stronger than the main final boss, or was the main final boss like the ultimate one in this case? Um, I don't... I don't think so. I think Mabu Frama was it. Yeah, it's like this is one of the rare RPGs that actually has the main final boss is the toughest boss in the game because go to any other RPG, Final Fantasy being the being the main one and the culprit of this, there's always a side boss that is ten times harder than the final boss. You mean Omega Weapon? Yup. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mean Omega Weapon? You mean you mean all of those? So yeah. No, Legend Legend of Dragon was such a. G I have the soundtrack. The soundtrack. I mean, I used the first boss theme as the opening theme for season four. <laughs> so it was just. I, I it was a very good soundtrack and very very underrated. I really really enjoyed it. And I was when I first played that I was really you know because Dart initially was kind of like the squall character like oh yeah. I'm just gonna shrug at everything. Ugh. That one Shana really came into play. Oh yeah. Then you know because early on in the game you know Dart's just like eh, whatever and I'm just like emote for fuck's sake. <laughs> And there was, I forget which scene it was, I mean there are like multiple ones, but there was this, there was one scene in there between Shana and Dart that was just like, okay, th especially the fam, especially the fanboys, which I was a huge one, even back then, were just like, okay, that was just amazing. I, f I keep on forgetting which scene it was, but it, it was like one of the ones where just like, yes, that is perfect. Now we're gonna fade to black and they're going to fuck and then we'll move on with our lives. <laughs> so... Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll just move on with that. But yes, The Legend of Dragoon, very, very good RPG. Incredibly underrated. I know Ryan and I kind of stole that one from anyone else talking. <laughs> so if anyone else wants to throw in their, a, a cent or two on that before I throw uh, out another game. Question on that one, though. Are the graphics actually halfway decent on the PS3, like with PlayStation Network for that? They actually hold up pretty well. Yeah, because I was going to say, I have Parasite Eve right now on the on the PlayStation Network, and the Holy graphics are shit. decent on that How one. could I forget to add Parasite fucking yeah. Eve to my list? <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. Good I have it on my list. <laughs> I, will let, I, I will let you have that one, Ron. Yes, go ahead. But but before we go back to you, we're now the, 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 the bottle has come back to me. <laughs> So we talked in the first half about how how PlayStation 1 invented genres. So I'm going to give you the one that pretty much invented the survival horror genre, Resident Evil. Resident Evil. Now my first my introduction to Resident Evil was with the second game. <laughs> It was with Resident Evil 2, because that's when actually the series started getting immensely popular. We have, you know, Resident Evil 2 with the story of Leon and Claire. Poor Leon, first day on the fucking job as a Raccoon City police officer, and he winds up in this. 
Meanwhile, Claire, the reason, Claire Redfield, she was the reason why I went back to play Resident Evil 1, because her main shtick, her main plot point for being in Raccoon City with all of this going on, is she's trying to find her brother Chris. And I'm like, oh, Chris is in Resident Evil 1, which means after I finish this, I'm going to have to go back and play Resident Evil 1 to, to finish to get some more story. But Resident Evil 2... Um had just it had probably at the time the most clever use of a loading screen ever hmm. I mean it, instead of just the now loadings every time you got to a door the, it would just cut to a shot of the door <laughs> and you would see it opening and I thought that was a wonderful wonderful touch because it was it was so much better than a, than there's the words now loading and but and the thing was that, because of the music in that game, you never knew what was on the other side. But there was one instance, and this only happened once in Resident Evil 2, where you open the door opens and a group of zombies barrel through it, and the music suddenly changes to this sharp screaming strings, and it's like ah panic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah fucking panic and the. Also, another thing that really, really was wonderful about that game was that the story was not only given through the gameplay, but through the notes you'd find of different perspectives. Like, you'd find a police officer's diary, or, you know, a civilian's memo, or some a maintenance guy's report. And all these little things to try to piece together what the hell happened. And, you know, then, then you dive into the story, you find out that... You know, the chief of, of the Raccoon City Police is on Umbrella's payroll. You find out that the reason why the zombie outbreak is occurring is because Umbrella wanted William Birkin's uh, research on the G-Virus. He refused to give it to them, so they killed him to get it. So in his dying moments, he injects the G-Virus into himself. <laughs> and... Vir- T-Virus gets carried all over the city, but the star of the show... To me, was Sherry? what? Uh, not so much Sherry. <laughs> Although uh, her um, that was a quick emergency. Um, <laughs> although it didn't she, take as long as I thought it was going. Although to. Sherry was was very important. Although the like the five ten minutes you play as her was, I remember some of the most harrowing because I'm like, oh fuck, you're playing as a kid. You have no weaponry to defend yourself. Shit. You might ha- I think they gave you maybe a, a green herb or two. Which was another interesting thing. The use of different color herbs to heal yourself. Potheads rejoice. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Green, mm, yeah. gr- green I'm herbs. I'm surprised it was in, set in Colorado. Well, shit. <laughs> no, no, Ra- Raccoon City was set in, you know, a, ni- a midwestern town in the United States, so it could be <laughs> it could be anywhere. But yeah, <laughs> Colorado. <laughs> green herbs to heal you, blue herbs to heal poison, red herbs which did nothing by themselves. They acted as a multiplier for the green herbs. And I'm like, oh, and then the first AIDS spray, which was like, oh, zombie bite. I'm just going to spray this aerosol on myself. <laughs> ah! Burn the desiccated bite out of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, uh, what are you, spraying Lysol on yourself? <laughs> That's how you cure the T-virus. Lysol freaking kills everything. <laughs> but, oh, okay. but some of the, the most memorable things for me about Resident Evil were the enemies, the antagonists, you know, in addition to your bit, ba- the liquors, those scared the Ugh. shit out of me. <laughs> and then the hunters, you would hear them, and suddenly, if you were, they they took out immense damage. And then, how if, about the the first time you saw a hunter, and it was hunter's eye view of them scurrying over stuff and jumping down? Yes. Like, uh oh, this this ain't good. <laughs> this is bad. This is very People bad. People are not thinking in three dimensions. The hunters are. It's like, oh fuck, this this could be bad. And then, of course, I've, as I've mentioned, William Birkin, uh, Police Chief Brian Irons, Mister X. Oh him, Mister yeah. X, which was Resident Evil 2's uh, tyrant. It wasn't for until years after Resident Evil 2 that I found out his name was Mister X. We always called him Neo Tyrant. 
Well, he kind of... He, he was. He basically was, just wearing a trench coat. Yes, we... I, I never caught that he was Mr. X. He was... At he, all. He was nasty. That's good. You didn't pick up the notes, did you? Which... <laughs> I picked up all of the notes. I may not have... Did you read all the notes? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Did you... And... And, uh... Um, 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 uh, then, of course, we have our, as Krauser would say in Resident Evil 4, you have the bitch in the red dress, Ada Wong. Oh, yes, her. She's actually one of my favorite characters of the entire series, because the way she works with Leon. <laughs> you know, there you have the only canonical romantic point of the entire series. So people who keep screaming that Leon... And Ashley from Resident Evil 4 are a duo. No. Wrong. <laughs> Fuck you. Play Resident Evil 2. But I digress. So then I played Resident Evil 3. You know, and Nemesis, Nemesis which... Dark. Oh, good lord. Because at that time, Nemesis... Well, before you figure out the pattern, and that only is on multiple playthroughs of the game, Nemesis could appear at random. Ugh. And then they figured... Then Capcom figured out, wait a minute, we can actually make him chase you! How it, terrifying was that? After... Especially, like, if you started on Resident Evil 3, you wouldn't... You, maybe you wouldn't think anything about it. Yes, it'd be scary he was chasing you, but when you're used to the old games, where, okay, you have this big thing, but you get to the next screen and you're fine. Yeah. And then... You're running forward, and you hear the door opening behind you. It wasn't even a door opening. It was a crash. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the storm one of them. It, it's, the, it's the iconic one I always think of. Ne Nemesis was not usually one for doorknobs. Yes. yes. Oh, that would be adorable to watch. It's like... Uh, but politeness. He, here was the thing. And I'm, here was the thing. As long as you were standing directly in front of the door, nothing would happen. But as soon as you move off screen and it changes perspective, it crash, and then there's the music. And and then it was like, run, you son! Because all you have is a freaking handgun. Maybe a shotgun at this point in the game. But you're like, this thing's not going to go down with some sort of... This thing's not going down with a pea shooter for a pistol. It's... <laughs> Because Resident Evil... Time for the infinite rocket launcher. Resident Evil 3 <laughs> had something that no other Resident Evil game, even to date, has. And that was the... You had places in the game where you had to make a split decision. And if you did not make the, the decision in, like, the 10 or 15 seconds they gave quick you... Quick time events. Quick time events. Well, not, not really quick time, because you had, like, actual seconds to think it over. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have the actual seconds, but it makes the choice for you if you do not press it quick enough. If Yeah, it, you would need maybe, if you don't make your decision within about 10 seconds, the game makes it for you, and you don't want the game to do that, because usually <laughs> it ended up in severe injury or, or death. And, but, you know, I remember Resident Evil 3 was just like, and, you know, Resident Evil 3 was uh, unique in terms of the story because the first half of the game takes place before Resident Evil 2. Then Resident Evil 2 happens. And then the game picks up, you know, with cur the current timeline. And again, so Resident Evil 3, you play as Jill, who is in far less clothing than she was in the first game. <laughs> and I'm like, here's, here's a funny thing. I have the novelization for Resident Evil 3. And the author, S.D. Perry, explains her choice of wardrobe as uh, she needed something form-fitting for ease of movement. And I went, <laughs> I went, nice, <laughs> I went, nice try. <laughs> nice. Uh -huh. See, I've always wondered that that about the, these horror games, especially with Resident Evil. I'm, I always wonder, saying, um, with the clothing styles, what do you want something that you could actually like hoist, hoister, like a. Uh, like a gun tour or something like that, with all the skimpy well, clothing, I'm wondering, what the hell are you going to put some yeah, of that wait, stuff? Wait, 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 Resident Evil 1, Resident Evil 1, they had, they had real outfits. Resident Evil 2, Leon had a real outfit, and Claire wasn't a police person. She just got shoved in the middle of it. And I always assumed in Resident Evil 3, Jill was caught out when all the stuff went down. Which isn't well, like which isn't she hadn't prepared. Which is entirely possible, but at the same time, the game, oh, the first part of the game 
opens with her in some sort of apartment, still wearing the same outfit. And, you know, she has some dialogue, and I'm like, well, wouldn't you think to even put on a gun holster? Where are you yeah. going to stick that shotgun? You think she would have picked one up at the police station later on? Yeah, you'd think that while well, for the short part of the game that you're actually in the Raccoon City police station, you'd think that she'd be like, "Hello, Our fl- <laughs> flak jacket, anything." <laughs> but no. Then after I played Resident Evil two and three, I went back to Resident Evil one, and remember when I mentioned the horrible examples of voice acting? I played the director's cut of Resident Evil 1. What? You better come look at this. What is it, Barry? <laughs> blood. This blood is still warm. I hope it's not... Chris's blood. Chris's blood. And, of course, the infamous uh, Master of Unlocking line and the You Were Almost a Jiggle Sandwich... Resident, Resident Evil 1 classics, though. was so mo- like, some people seem to think that those were, like, unintentionally bad, and I disagree. Resident Evil 1 was totally designed off of the old B-movies. It was absolutely intentional that A- was absolutely ridiculous. It just tried to be serious later in other games. Yes. <laughs> we'll get to you soon, Ron. Don't worry. So I'm I'm going to uh, yeah. But I mean, Resident Evil One was so you know B movie. I was amazed that it spawned the franchise that it did because some of the things are just notoriously campy and cheesy. But people love that kind of stuff too, and like that's. Uh... That's not usually in video games. No, no, so it it's kind of fun. Isn't. I mean, when do you have a game that involves zombies and puzzle solving? It's and... the kind of game that would be on MST 3K. Yes, if if, if they did that, yes, if they did games. It was a perfectly spoofable game. So, Absolutely. So, you know, classic Resident Evil. It's it started the survival horror genre. And with that, I'm going to shut up about Resident Evil and give it back <laughs> to Ronnie. Uh, Ron actually had a really good idea, considering we're not going to be on for that much longer. So I'm just going to list off the games on my list and then choose one to talk about. But I'm just going to give a little a little rundown on, on games that I thought were influential that I wanted to mention. You also don't know if you're going to be on um, the second part of this. Uh... I have no idea if I'm going to be on the second part, so I'm going to mention them. Go ahead. Um... First, Tenchu, um, which was a very interesting uh, kind of stealth game. It, I, I actually think it was one of the earliest stealth games. Uh, I really enjoyed it. You play ninja, you have to go around assassinating people. Great idea. Let's do that. Um, Spyro the Dragon, I know other people are going to bring him up. He'll be brought up in the second Hell half. Yeah. No one else does. But uh, Wild Arms, probably for me in my childhood one of the most influential RPGs to my personal like of the genre um, from the PlayStation era um, where you play three different characters uh, Parappa the Rappa yes I think somebody... it's on my list <laughs> yeah so on my uh, list. I think it's on a lot of our list it wasn't I, it I was... still have those songs on my head it wasn't on my initial list um, I'm I'm just skipping off ones that I know other people are going to mention, but I have two more I'll mention. One is, as Brian mentioned earlier, Monster Rancher, which was Pokemon without any of that boring walking around stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, basically. And I... finally, the one. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, and finally, the game I'm going to talk about because I know no one else will ever mention it: Rival Schools. You know Anybody I love play that game. Schools? You know I, I love that. Did we have a discussion about that before? <laughs> yes, we, we totally that. did. <laughs> because we're both Sakura fans. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, Rival Schools uh, is the one I'm going to mention a little bit about. That's my choice. Um, Rival Schools was uh, from the team that did Street Fighter. It is directly connected. Street Fighter, Sakura from Street Fighter, is a playable character. Um... And it's a game that... It's a fighting 
they introduced, I'm pretty sure it was the first one to do uh, tag team fighting, where you have a team of play of characters and you can switch between them during gameplay. Um, and it had, it, it was their first real movement into an in-depth story for their Street Fighter games, where Rival Schools was entirely story-focused with your gangs from each of the schools or groups from each of the schools where students are being kidnapped and you're trying to figure out what happened to your friends. Um, and it all comes down to this one guy who's bringing all the people together and trying to cre become the lord of everything because, you know, that's where all this always goes. Um, but Rival Schools was just a very fun game, very different. Uh, it was definitely them trying some new stuff that definitely paid off in the later Street Fighter games. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a game I love. Shauna, would you like to I mean, chime in? Yeah, I mean, like, there was cutscenes in between fights, so, like, it wasn't just your straight, like, it wasn't like Mortal Kombat where you just go up the ladder and it's like, all right, next dude, next dude. It was like, you went into each battle with a purpose. Like, it would be like, level one opens up and it would be like, hey, those kids over there, they look mysterious or whatever. Hey, I think they're suspicious. We should fight them. And then they would fight them, and then after, they'd be like, kids got kidnapped from our school, too. Oh, my God. And you'd go on to the next level. But, so it had that cinematic thing that made you actually, it did get you into the game a little bit more if you weren't just into the straight fighting up the ladder and getting to the final boss thing. Um, it's also deliciously Japanese, let's just say, because the whole, like, like high school, you know, the whole uh -huh. high school drama with, like, you know, the, oh, that school the is American our Bible. team. The, the American team being oh, uh... the. The yeah. American team is hilarious. It's nothing but a football player, the one black dude in the game, who has a mohawk, <laughs> and the girl is a cheerleader who is wearing yes, God knows was. what, but it's all it's all red, white, and blue with like a big star over her. It's the most dramatically stupid like pinup girl outfit you've ever seen in your life. But the game's hilarious. It, it's but it's so fun. And like you had your school of like the jocks and like you know, so like that school was like oh there was a guy who plays soccer, there was a guy who plays baseball. You had the school from the bad side the of the tracks girl. that yeah the volleyball girl. You had the school from the bad side of the tracks that was all kind of like the punk kids like the bikers. Yeah. yeah, the biker chick and all that. So like it 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 was fun though. It was really fun and like. But it, it had that cinematic thing to it that kind of pushed a little it's further. Very tongue -in -cheek. I think it, you know, like you said, it, it was very tongue in cheek. Very much so. I've heard of this game, but I, I never so. played it, so. But you it's, should, uh, you, I was going to say, if you like the kind of Street Fighter fighting game, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's a little bit of a different thing from the genre, and it's, it's, you, you can see how it influenced stuff later, coming later. Right. Alrighty, well, we've got about 12 minutes, so I'm going to uh, let Ron have some words. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about... Cause actually, cause how many I, games do I actually, have I here? actually think I skipped you over in the first round, so my apologies. <laughs> mention mention some games! Okay, I'm going to mention Alundra. This was a game that came out in North America at the end of 1997, so basically 1998. It was originally... Oh, sorry, it's a special sequel to Landstalker on the Sega Genesis. Um, not many, I don't, I don't say there's many people play this one. It's more of a, like, one of the, like, little hidden gems of the PS1 era. Um, it is a role-playing game, or RPG, um, like, um, action-adventure type thing with very small puzzle elements to it. Um, you are playing as a Alundra, the protagonist. And you have to, you wash up on shore of this little village, and the village is being beset by strange circumstances where people are dying in the middle of their dreams, and they're dying in real life at the same time. And you have to delve into their dreams as Alundra and save them from their nightmare that's going to kill them. That's interesting. And, and like after you try and help people out and you save them from nightmares, you have to like try and piece together, um, like what's causing it, and explore the world and figure out, like, get levels and gear and your normal adventure, action adventure, or, like Zelda type things. 
and eventually try and save the the village and the world itself. It almost sounds like a reverse nightmare on Elm Street. Like you don't want kind them of. to die in their dreams. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I had I like the game is. Yeah, it was fine. I, I enjoyed it as a kid. It was a little difficult, I found, but I'm pretty sure if I went back and played it now, it'd be a lot, a little bit more easier. Uh, the next game that I'm going to talk about is Brave Fencer Musashi, which was a action role playing game. You play as the Musashi. He is a mystical swordsman that is revived to help uh, save the kingdom from a evil, maniacal, m magic tech empire. And you use your sword abilities and your um, various, like, um, sword techniques and, like, magic to save yourself and, and the world from the evil, 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 the evil steam-powered empire. Bad steampunk. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Steampunk, bad. Very bad. And then the, for the third game I'm going to bring up, uh, which will be the main one that I'm pretty sure most of us have played, Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Ooh, yeah, that was a fun one. I forgot about that one. Um, this is probably the, the if in, in combination with Metroid, the, the other part of the Metroidvania, where it is a 2D side-scroller where you have play as one particular character, in this case, Alucard, and you have to explore Dracula's castle and get power-ups and things like that to stop Dracula from resurrecting, only this time he's being resurrected by this person who's supposed to kill him in the first place. The, uh, uh, where is it? Richter, yeah, Richter Belmont. Richter, Richter, Richter. Belmont is the one reviving Dracula, Richter. and you have to stop him. That, that game right there, I think all of us played that at one point or another. Oh yeah, I I've got the I've got the uh, more resurrected ones for the PS3 for that one, and oh boy, that is a fun series, especially for the resurrected versions. I, I wasn't a. You see, here's the thing: I love Castlevania Symphony of the Night. I love the rest of them now, but the old Castlevanias were so freaking hard. I could never get into them when I was a kid. <laughs> it was Symphony of the Night that got me into Castlevania and made me care enough to go through and beat the old ones. Yeah. There's also some voice acting in here, which leads to some of the more memorable lines of, what is man? Nothing but a miserable pile of lies. A miserable little pile of secrets. That too. <laughs> um, there's a very interesting soundtrack. You have a mix of like classical, like violin, heart music, and then you have your techno rock and some, uh, even some metal, uh, like, jazz saxophone playing. Am I really the only that really enjoyed this game, or just no one else has anything else to add to I it? I haven't played this one. Okay. Yeah, I never played it, so... <laughs> okay, um... I mean, it, it, it's very... It, this is definitely, like, the other... Like I said, like, the other half of the Metroidvania. Like, you, you, anything that you played recently that would have, like, a... 2D platforming level up type thing, like you can probably trail back to this. There's a lot of exploring to do, mm -hmm. um, a lot of hidden power ups and items that you could find. The map percentages kind of helped guide you along, along with the reveal of what you thought was going to be the end of the game. Switching over to the second castle. Yeah. So, so much for the fake ending of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because um, you can correct me. I, I I honestly cannot remember because I just go through it every time from here on out and always make sure I unlock the second half of the castle. Mm -hmm. I could have sworn though that if you kill Richter, it doesn't unlock. Yeah, you get you just get an ending. Yeah, but if you save Richter from what's possessing him. You spoiler alert. Uh, you save him, unlock the second half of the castle, which is literally the castle upside down, and much much harder. And much much harder, yes, <laughs> yes. That sounds ridiculous. So it, it 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 really is a, an interesting thing because the, you go through it the first time, you're just like, oh, it's a normal castle, but then you play it in reverse, mm -hmm. 
you want to slide down and, and inverse like that. It now that the monster is harder, but you kind of think about like, wait, so if I'm here, then the map over there was this, and then if I try and go here, do I get a power up? It and then really you run does. To a, like, <laughs> then you run into a room and find out you're facing death. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, re it really does like make you give a lot of respect to the level designers because they had to design every room to be playable in two directions. Yeah. Like, they, every every room is accessible in both castles, so everything had to be designed so that it worked both inverse and regularly and make it's it not so... not give a way that it could work inverse. Because there was exactly. no at all that this was going to happen unless you, A, save him, and or unless you save him. Yeah, they, there was no way of knowing it. And, like, it was... That was the biggest... I think that was the biggest surprise other than uh, a specific part in Final Fantasy VII that I think we all remember. But this is, that was probably the biggest surprise in, in the PlayStation era was that the Upside Down Castle and the fact that, whoops, you're only halfway through the game. Looks like you got a lot yeah. more to play. Which also leads to a very funny thing of like where you some where usually save files of the game like they show map percentages of percentage of map found where some mm -hmm. of them will end up at a hundred I think the max you can get is two hundred and seven point four percent. Yep. And they're like, wait, what? Why do you have two hundred percent of map found? <laughs> How is that even mathematically possible? <laughs> well, you have a hundred percent of the map for the first one. And they couldn't make it 50% because they didn't want you to realize as you got to the end of the game that you only discovered half of it. So the second map is brings you up to 200%. And then there's a couple secret areas that are not on the map that bring you up slightly over the 100% mark that aren't that aren't recorded on the map normally. Yeah, and they're found in both in both versions of the map. It's um, like ghouls and ghosts mean. It really is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I do remember one this also. Yes, yeah, that's one of the better Castlevania games. I also remember this having introducing uh, uh, the mist form, which was ridiculously mm -hmm. broken. Because once you got to a certain point, you could almost go through the entire map as just one gigantic cloud of mist, and just skip almost every single enemy and just fight the bosses. Well, you could also get the the Chrysogrim, Is it the the instantly kill everything in the game weapon? Yeah. Once you, yeah, that was really bad. It hit. It. Uh, it's unlike the other ones where you swing and hit things. It swings and hits about every point one second. So if you pr hold the button down for like a second, it'll hit the enemy like ten times. So it just gives everything in front of you. Yeah, it's definitely a game where it rewards you for exploring because you find the ridiculously overpowered items that you should not. <laughs> be able to find normally and turn mm -hmm. some of the, the end game fights from really really difficult into this is a cakewalk <laughs> yeah anybody out there if you haven't played Castlevania Symphony of the Night it's one of the best games they've ever made go play it <laughs> and now you've been given That's a, a demand. Yeah, you've been given a yeah. directive from, from Ronnie so you know go do it alright you won't regret it well, we're, we are almost done with this first episode of our anniversary, so we're going to get one more game from Shanna and Ryan, and then we're going to have to wrap this up, otherwise we'll be here all night. Because <laughs> yeah. we haven't even gotten to some of the biggest ones. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it is technically Super Bowl Sunday, and I have a puppy bowl to watch, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's puppy bowl. <laughs> so, so there. All right, Shanna, one more from you. Pick a game. It could All be right, a big one, game, it could be anything? a little one. Any game you've got. that. Uh... All right, we're doing a second round, too, right? So I can... We're doing a second episode, but, you know, so okay. So Pick I'll one. hold off some of these, but... So then I guess I'm just going to go right back to uh, Parappa the Rappa, because we haven't really talked about it yet. <laughs> Have fun! I've never <laughs> played this game. I've seen Me the ridiculous neither. commercials. This was a, pretty sure it was like a launch title for the PlayStation, wasn't it? Or yeah, right it around... Was. It was, it was a pretty big title at the beginning of the PlayStation's life. I don't know if it was a launch title or not, but, um... And when you think about it, Parappa the Rappa really was, um... It really was ahead of its time, in a way. I mean, you think about it, and this whole rhythm-based sort of game thing... Rhythm-based music gameplay. 
Yeah, with music gameplay, I mean, something that became so prevalent with things like Rock Band and, and Guitar Hero, I mean, this was the first time you really had something like that, where the whole entire point of the game was just keeping up with the rhythm. I now, would support a revival. Oh, absolutely, but I have to ask this, because I don't know if it was just me, if I was nuts or what, but... Mm. You're did nuts. that game have like the worst control ever, or was it just? It, it was pretty bad. bad. Okay, it, it was wasn't pretty bad button scheming and controlling. You 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 so didn't love the game for its controls. You loved it because it was hilarious and had great graphics, at least in my opinion. But well, you didn't love it for the controls. Great music, music sing along too. I mean, for one thing, it had very. Go ahead. I just remember the demo. Like I, when I got my PS One, it came with a demo disc of like ten or twelve games. Yeah, and I just flipped too. a lot of Power Rapper the Rapper until I got Final Fantasy Seven. <laughs> and that's why, that's why I remember the kick punch all in the rhyme block. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. For one thing, yeah, it was just the songs. Uh, but the controls were like, because I'm th I'm like, I have good rhythm. I, I could keep a beat. And I'm like, I don't understand it. This sounds right to me, and all I'm getting is fails. Yeah, like, I'm like, it's, what it's, is going it's weird on? one combination of like you have to X down arrow L1 L2 circle <laughs> triangle square up up left square circle 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 and you have to press all those buttons in like maybe two seconds for some yeah. songs and you're just like what the fuck is this I, I, I expected to play a rhythm game, not a not a not a not a stress test. So I basically, you had to enter in you, you had to enter in a code for a fatality. It was what you had to do. <laughs> yeah, every every yeah. second enter a fatality. I had no sense of rhythm at all, so I played that game for the comedy, but I could never beat it because I just. I mean, I'm suck. good at theater rhythm. I'm good at drumming and rock band. I know I got rhythm, but like. It just wasn't happening for me in that game. I think I only got as far as the Rasta Frog. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember, I, I got past the, you know, and that's the other thing. The characters' designs in this game were out of control. I mean, <laughs> the, art styles, out. <laughs> the art style is beautiful, but you start this game off, you know, learning karate from an onion man, and <laughs> you make the way to, like, what was the one who taught you how to drive? Was that a cow? It was like a cow in a little hat? I'm pretty sure it was a cow, yeah. And then like, and the roster. And then the girl, you, and the girl you like is the is the uh, the lamb. I thought you liked the sunflower. I thought you had a crush on the sunflower chick. Oh no no, it was the sunflower. The lamb was uh, her friend. Right. But I know right. her because she got her own game. Um Jammer oh, Lammy. Oh, um Jammer Lammy. Yeah, a great yeah. sister type. Same concept, but you just play guitar in it instead, than, rather than rapping. Yes. But yes, yeah, I mean. Jamming. <laughs> But yeah, I mean that's just that's a that's a good old PlayStation classic. And even if the controls were horrible, I mean it was it was very visually stunning at the time because you never saw like it's one thing to have just the good graphics and things that look photorealistic, but this was a cool like almost Paper Mario ish sort of thing. I mean like everything was it's kind South of South Park. It, it is South Park. It's absolutely South Park. And like it was a little jarring and strange, but it was also kind of cool. Like it was just an odd game, but it was. I think it stuck out because it was so different, and that's what made it so popular. I, I think that I think that's a great example of how experimental things were at the beginning of the PlayStation, where, okay, we have this new thing, and it's different than everything else, and we can just design anything! We're gonna design Absolutely. a paper cutout game about rapping! Like, how? Nobody would even think about that nowadays. But back then, not only did it come out, it did well, and the songs were actually good too. Like they, the songs could have been horrible, but they were actually like catchy, fun tracks. I mean, it, the fact of the matter is, we're still sitting here saying "Kick Punch." It's all in the mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just for your own uh, information, Parappa the Rapper came out two years after the PS One launched in the United States. Really? Uh, yep. I thought it was sooner than that, huh? Came out in '97, and I wonder if that game helped to inspire DDR, which would come out in 1999. Oh, Japan's, sure always, yeah. Japan's always been kind of ahead in terms of like the music stuff because they had guitar peripherals for the PlayStation and the PlayStation 2 long before the West picked up on it with Guitar Hero. Yeah, that, that's that's also pretty true. 
Alrighty, Ryan, we will give you the last uh, game dimension. Alright, this one I'm actually going to do, not the PS1, but an early PS2 game that was one of my favorites, and it's actually a prequel to another one. You'll know which one I'm talking about. Shadow of Colossus. Ryan, that's a PS2 game. Um, that that's gonna have to get wiped off the list. Ah, uh, cause let me see what I I think I have like a color. Oh, Tekken. I gotta go. I gotta go into Tekken. Okay, actually. that works. Tekken, I, was... I I have to go into because that was probably one of the best games I ever played. I think it started off with what Tekken Three was for the. That was, was my it? introduction to Tekken as well. Was Tekken Three? Tekken Three. Hey, that was 3. the one on the oh, best selling list. Oh, yes, Tekken 3, I can remember, my favorite was definitely Jin with that one, and everybody kept on wondering, what the hell, what the hell is, um, Eddie on, because he was always freaking... <laughs> and wasn't there, like, a panda as a, uh... Yes, there was. Yep. And I, 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 I was playing Tekken 3, and I'm like, the Jen? fuck? <laughs> the fuck is a bear doing here? <laughs> well, didn't Apparently Tekken they were watching too much Ranma House. I think also, <laughs> I've come, you guys can me if I'm wrong, but with the PlayStation 1, we had like three or four fighting games come out for it almost immediately, didn't we? We had Tekken, Virtua Fighter, and yeah. Dead or Alive. Well, yeah, Virtua, Dead or, oh, yeah. Virtua, Fighter, Virtua Fighter had its roots on the Genesis. Yeah. Okay. It, and it probably saw the PlayStation and was like, wait, now we can really have Virtua Fighter. Yeah. Really? Look at that game. And it's I, just that it looked. <laughs> and I don't know if it was the Tekken series itself or was it, if it was a different series that actually I, I honestly think in all honesty with, with Tekken it was the one that came that made up the whole button mashing catchphrase for, for um, some of the fighting games because literally with that you're just trying to press the buttons you didn't give a shit about what the, co what the actual combos were you were just pressing the buttons to get moves out and do damage to other people I don't know Street Fighter's the hot in the hundred hand slaps, pretty button mashy. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that. And and Tekken One came out very early in the PS One's life cycle. Came out two months after the the system launched. So wow. it came out in November of uh, ninety five. So wow, dang. But yeah, I, I always with the, with the Tekken series, I've always loved that. I think Tekken. Five is the most recent one I play with that, but Tekken, Tekken three got me into that because literally I was just going with Jin all the time, and I think it was the one move I kept on using was Demon Punch that I kept on pissing people off with. I can remember playing Andrew actually had it for the for the PS one. I can remember playing it against him. He always used Eddie in those damn dance moves that kept on slapping you off your feet, and I'm just like, are you freaking kidding me? I hated that more than anything else. And then who was Eddie the was the Capoeira guy, right? Yeah. Who was right. the uh, Chinese girl that we had in there? I want to say her name was Z Zing Yao or something. Zing Yao, like yeah, something like that. She was. I, always... I might be wrong, but yeah. Yeah, she was one of the most interesting ones. And that who the hell was it that we had? It was just always like a freaking ah uh, shit. I'm trying to remember her name. She was pretty much like all the busty girl of the tech of the game, pretty much. Like was it she... Nina something or other. It. Nina, I, and I, th I think there was one other. Let, let me see if I can, if I can. I, find I know it. there was a Nina. Um, Nina was one of the more fun characters to play to play as. Let me see if I can look it up. Look it up. Who the characters character was? Let me see. It was Nina Williams. You. Yeah, Tekken she, also had that guy Anna, with the, uh... Anna Williams. That's right. Anna. I think Anna. it was her sister Anna that was just. Yeah, you. She was just like, yeah. Basically, all the guys want to go for her because of that. She shows off everything, pretty much. The Ivy of the Tekken world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pretty much, and I also remember one of my more fun characters that you got to use was uh, Yoshimitsu, <laughs> who also crossed into the Soul Caliber. Yup. Oh yeah, he did. Him on his bouncing pogo stick sword. <laughs> That's a game we'll need to bring up in the next one. That is yes. Soul Blade. So that is uh yeah, I remember I remember Tekken three not so much from my own playing of it, but for my stepbrothers because sometimes he'd wake up before me and he would, you know, play in the 
he would play, and he was playing Tekken 3, and he had run into a brick wall <laughs> playing against the computer. I forget which character it was, but I woke up to the sound of a controller being smashed to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. That was that was one instance. Same game. Um, he was also playing in the morning, but he didn't want to wake anybody up this time. So to try to vent his anger, he he bit into the controller. Whoa! <laughs> Ow! Yeesh. And oh yeah, I th I do have the controller with teeth marks. It's uh... a. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Oh wow! So you know, I'm like, well, that's good plastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could tell that the that the PlayStation One was made out of pretty decent quality. Mmm, tasty. So, <laughs> but yes, survives. <laughs> Tekken Three was a lot of fun. Even oh. even some of the uh, the side games, like wasn't there like a volleyball? Uh, there was game. I think for that one. I'm yeah. like, I'm like, okay, now because um, Mortal Kombat tried to do something silly like puzzle combat or whatever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's... but there we are. We've gone over two hours, ladies and gentlemen, and we haven't even gotten to <laughs> the heaviest hitters on the PS1 list. I mean, you know oh, where they God. are. So for those of you listening to this episode, don't worry. Before you start screaming, well, why didn't you mention you know Metal Gear Solid or Final Fantasy VII? Don't worry. We, are going... we have long lists. We have, all oh, of us yeah. have very long lists. We are just, we are just scratching the Teensiest bit of the surface here. So on that, whenever we get to do part two, we're going to bring up the heavy hitters. Don't you worry. <laughs> Don't you worry your pretty little heads about it. So, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts about the games we mentioned on part one of this play space play PlayStation <laughs> PlayStation <laughs> retrospective, you can always send us. Any sort of comments on Facebook.com slash DL Content, Twitter at DL Content, Tumblr, DLC Podcast.tumblr.com. You can always email us, DLcontent1 at gmail.com. And of course, all episodes can be found on iTunes, YouTube, and Stitcher. So there you have it. Hopefully, we will have the same panel back for the, for part two of this. If not, we'll hopefully get some f some new voices in, or me, or if possible, expand the panel. But that could be dangerous. <laughs> that could be extraordinarily dangerous. So it remains for me to thank Ron, Ronnie, right, a lot of R's there, and Shanna <laughs> for joining me on part one of this 20th anniversary of the PlayStation episode. You'll definitely get a part two. Don't you worry. We've got a lot more games to talk about. With that said, I am Brian. Have a good one, everybody.